For thousands of years, Aborigine tribes, scattered across the vast continent of Australia, spoke literally hundreds of languages. Today, there are barely 100,000 full-blood Aborigines, and their languages are now almost as vanished as their way of life. The English settlers who drove the Aborigines almost to extinction were themselves the outcasts of the world's first industrial society. This is the story of Cockneys and Australians, of English in exile. This is the church of St. Mary Le Beau in the city of London. Traditionally, if you're born within the sound of its bells, you're a true Londoner. London English has always had a distinctive note of its own. In the 19th century, large numbers of the working people in and around London left for Australia, New Zealand, Southern Africa, even the Falkland Islands. And to this day, these accents of English share a strong family likeness. In Victorian times, the London language was used by Sam Weller in Dickens' Pickwick Papers. It was the language of London street vendors and flower sellers, the most famous of whom was Eliza Doolittle in Shaw's Pygmalion. It was and is one of the most influential forms of English in our story. And it's the accent known round the world as Cockney. London's East End lies down the Thames from Tower Bridge. It's an area of docklands and slums. Traditionally, this is the home of poverty and crime, of Oliver Twist and Jack the Ripper. It was a place that many Victorians dared not go, as unexplored, one wrote, as Timbuktu, and even fewer understood it. The East Enders themselves were simply looked down on as slum dwellers. Here, it gets on your nerves where everything's filthy. Dirty, filthy walls, and the vermin in the walls is wicked. Same with the passage, that's all the same on the crook. Cockney speech was scorned as bad or slovenly or slang. For outsiders, Cockneys were cheeky rascals with hearts of gold and a song on their lips. The Cockneys were a classic English working class stereotype, though almost nothing authentic was known about them or their language. Cockney has spread beyond the East End and it's heard throughout London some of the broadest from costermongers and barrow boys. This is Walthamstow Market in northeast London. Today, the speech of some 10 million people in and around London is influenced by Cockney. George Bonner is a Cockney with a stall in Walthamstow. You heard them last week, you know what they're all about. I'm here. Have you seen my navel? How are they? We call it getting an edge. Two, it means four, you're getting people six, to line up. 
Or either cutting a grapefruit or cutting an orange, showing people they like and giving them tastes. Anybody want a bit? Oh, you'll have a bit, haven't you? You ain't had none lately, have you? And you can do it a lot of ways. You lark about or you come out with big words. Wait a minute. You're going in home if you keep on. You give me the right mucking fuddle every time you come up. Six, eight. Got Mark one there for nothing. Don't bring it back. Have a look, my navel. Never seen anything like it. Bob Barltrop is a Cockney, a local historian who's compiling a new dictionary of Cockney English. The word Cockney is said to have come from the Middle Ages, from two Middle English words which mean a cock's egg, and a cock's egg was an inferior and worthless little thing that sometimes appeared. In short, a cockney was a runt, a pampered person too. Really, it's the countryman's view of the city dweller. And London dwellers were called cockneys with this meaning, certainly in Chaucer's time, four, five, six hundred years ago. Bob Baltrop's friend, Jim Wolveridge, runs a bookstall in the Mile End Road. He's described his Stepney childhood in his autobiography, Ain't It Grand? Writing together, Bob Barltrop and Jim Wolveridge have also collaborated on an insider's account of the speech and traditions of their fellow Cockneys. They call their book the Mother Tongue. They always shared the research and writing and used to hold their editorial conferences at Fred's Cafe, or in proper Cockney, CAF. It's an ideal place to discuss the nuances of Cockney idiom and pronunciation. The vowel sounds are the most basic feature of Cockney. Instead of saying out, you say art. Instead of saying round, you say round. The characteristic of Cockney that everybody knows, of course, is dropping the H. Shop. Hello, love. How are you? I'm fine. Right? Yeah, fine. Hello, Bob, mate. Hello, Irene. Coming for a couple of please. How's Fred? Oh, he's fine, love. Working hard or in the back. It's a part of Cockney where you have an L on the end of the word to attach a kind of oo sound so that you don't say meal, you say me all and make it meal. Or you say feel and wheel. And then there are other things, the TH sound. Well, Cockneys never do this. They say mother and father and think, and this is part of classic Cockney speech. These words which people use when they address one another, Jim, uh, mate, and charm, dear and love from women, um, brother, governor, cock, and all the rest of them. They all mean something, don't they? They're not just casually yeah. used words. Yes, they've got many meanings, and they can change their meanings with a tone of voice. You, you take mate, you can be very friendly, you can be hostile. Watch it, mate. What's up you, mate? Yeah, or my old chum my here, old chum meaning here. this fellow I know nothing at all about. Uh, mush, he's a china of mine. Yeah. Brother. Um, brother. Squire. You know, mate, curiously enough, it's the number one address word among Cockneys, and it's the number one address word among Australians. And they use a very big word to them. And the only thing that distinguishes the Cockney is his sheer enjoyment of words. He loves to stand them on end and make them jump through hoops and turn circles and this kind of thing. There's nothing better to a Cockney than to talk, to talk enjoyably, to talk colourfully, to use wonderful phrases. This is Cockney. Spitalfields Market has been at the centre of the Cockney tradition night and day for centuries. A favourite trick with the market traders here is Cockney rhyming slang. A wife is trouble and strife. A titfer is a hat from tit for tat. Talk becomes rabbit and pork, which led to rabbiting on. George Bonner comes here every day at three in the morning to buy fruit and veg for the family stall. They're the sort of the earth for Cockney. They accept people. They're very friendly people and they will have a laugh with you. And walk through the market and nothing gives you more thrill 
they go and say, morning, George. And it's lovely. Morning, Dave. Oh, what is your own business? Turn around. 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 But that's their makeup. This is the way they are. They're, they're good people. Another kind of slang which you'll hear among Cockneys is back slang. In the middle of the 19th century, it was used as a secret language by street traders, by costermongers. Instead of saying somebody's fat, you say they're taff. Yob is the best known of all the back slang words, the most persistent one. It simply means a boy. Ronnie! Can you do Ryder in a cage, please? About 40 packages. You'll hear rhyming slang and back slang, the argo of the market, when food trader Artie Welsh haggles over the latest prices with his friend and business rival, George Bonner. Artie is a salesman I mostly deal with. He talks my language. You can have a trade with him and have a laugh with him. And uh, you go up and say, how's the tomato job this morning? Which means, what is the price of the tomatoes? Hello. Hi, Jules. Oh, uh, not bad. How's the tomato job? We have to leave yourself a lot of room to move with Jules. You can't ask him what you want for the gear. Pellet's trebles, that pellet's double. Oh, pellet trebles. Let's have a look at these trebles. Yeah. What sort of money these trebles got coming? Three and a half, Jules. And I'll be talking to someone like George. I say, right, George, you can be a roast there. Roast is four. It's, it's four backwards. And he knows I've had him four pounds. Well, there's all trebles here. Yeah. Three Basically, every pounds. number has Sorry, got a slang. Equivalent. Three and a half with me. Up to a rope with them, but three and a half. Carpet is free. You want to charge me a carpet with a bit of it? Score or an apple is 20. Score. Send the score out there for 360 just so the geezer. We'll say something sensible then. And then there's cockle, which is cock and then 10. How many are you looking for? Score? Uh, no, about 30. All right. 320. Go on. 320. It's going all your way. How's the claim job? You'll bid him. And he don't take offence. You'll swear at each other. But he don't take offence, Artie. We can have a laugh, you know. What sort of money? I'll try to do three quick with this. No, they're not good enough for me. No, they're not good enough. Can No, they're not good enough. Don't like them. See me tomorrow, eh? I've got, I've got some coming up tonight. How's a great job? Cockneys love to have grand sounding words or words which, to which they can attach a special meaning. Words which you can say really importantly and majestically and diabolical. Not only a diabolical liberty, but if you can say with great presence, that's absolutely diabolical, isn't it? That sounds great. Another one which Cockneys are immensely fond of is impunity. He walks in and out of here with impunity. As he'll do. Very good. Not too many towels. This How And they look this morning. Best in England, Jules. Not too small. Look at the size of them. Can't you go somewhere else? Look, look. Give me 25 pence. Your murder. <laughs> Georgie Bonner's paid. Can I order the chase on this? Yeah, yeah. you don't get no credit with me. George. Give us the money. Give us the no, 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 your murder. Please. Please, your murder. Many Cockney words came from languages which were brought into the East End from outside. The great wave of Jewish immigrants who started coming here in the 1880s brought Yiddish. The Cockneys quickly picked it up. Nosh for food. Gazump for a swindle. Shemuzzle for a to-do, schmutter for clothing. One other source of words for Cockneys is Hindustani. We had Hindustani long before we had immigrants from there, because before the First World War, serving soldiers, of whom a great many were Cockneys, most of them went to India, and they picked the verbal pockets of the Indians, as they do everybody else's. And they bought at home words like a deco for a look, Shufti, which means a look round as well. Bakshi, for going free. Dulali, for somebody who's balmy. And quite a number of others. And there are a surprising number of Romany words in Cockney. word that everybody knows is pal for a friend, which actually is the Romany word for brother. Another favourite word for addressing somebody, mush. Pikey mush. Yes. Hello, Pikey mush. We call the gypsies pikeys, and mush means face. Hello, gypsy face. Dukes for hands is a Cockney favourite, as in a sentence like, put up your dukes, mate. Of course, when an East Londoner does rise in the world and aspire to the upper orders, the first thing he does is try to change his speech. Yes, indeed. I think anybody who sounds H's and puts on formalised speech 
is going to be thought of as somebody who's putting it on. He's aspiring above his station, isn't he? Well, again, it depended on the person's own attitude. Um, we didn't mind a man rising the world, for instance, but if he felt himself superior, then we despise, dislike his action. This is the whole point about modern Cockney, that it's a working-class speech. And it's not just East London speech and South London speech, it's working-class East London working speech. speech. That's the whole point about it. What we call Cockney speech today, in its backbone, was the speech of the citizens of London, not necessarily the lower order citizens of all classes, except probably the court, and certainly in the late Middle Ages, and certainly in Elizabethan times. In Queen Elizabeth's reign, a London funeral director, Henry Machen, kept a diary. The spelling mistakes in Machen's diary are vital clues to the sound of Elizabethan London English. When Machen wrote half a hundred in red and white, this is his spelling of half. Describing a mugging, a man thrust between the ribs, this is his spelling of thrust. Henry Machen dropped ages off his words because he hardly ever heard the ages sounded. He wrote words like chains and strange with a Y in them instead of an A. He actually wrote them as chines and strange because he heard people say them like that. What you see in these is this representation of the way people spoke. He wrote words like mother and feather as mother and feather with V's in them. And the, you know, there are so many more of these. Up to the 18th century, up to, say, about 1750, Cockney was the speech of anybody and everybody in the city of London. But the second half of the 18th century was an age of great social change. Because it was an age of change, you had a new social class who wanted a way to identify themselves. The way they picked on was speech. If you spoke properly, if you had good grammar, enounced words in a received way, then you marked yourself as a member of the upper class. Until the 18th century, there was virtually no formal guidance about the proper spelling and pronunciation of English. The language was in such a state of flux that writers like Jonathan Swift proposed an academy to regulate it. It was not until Samuel Johnson started work on his dictionary in this house that what we now know as standard English began to emerge. Before Dr. Johnson, writers like Jonathan Swift had warned that English was being corrupted, as they put it, by change. Johnson, a man who raised common sense to the heights of genius, scorned the idea of permanence in language. To believe in that, he said, was to believe in the elixir of eternal life. Yet, paradoxically, the work that was done in this house gave the language its first stabilizing authority and it's an important milestone in the history of English. The two volumes of Johnson's Dictionary linked spoken English to a printed standard. Now the educated middle class learned to speak like the dictionary and scorned the illiterate Cockneys who did not. The dictionary's 40,000 definitions provide the basis of standard English and its influence has lasted to this day. Dr. Johnson treated English very practically as a living language, with words having many different shades of meaning. Some of his definitions are still miracles of clarity. For example, heart, the muscle which by its contraction and dilation propels the blood through the course of circulation. It is supposed in popular language to be the seat sometimes of courage, sometimes of affection. And some were famously idiosyncratic, like oats, a grain which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. And describing his own efforts here, a lexicographer, a writer of dictionaries, a harmless drudge. When the harmless drudge had completed this immense labor, his biographer James Boswell remarked that single-handed he had conferred stability on the language of his country. After Johnson, Educated people would spell and pronounce words according to the dictionary. Half, not off. Thrust, not frust. Chain, not chine. 
And so Cockney, the speech which had been the honourable speech of the citizens of London, in a quite short space of time became the speech of the lower orders who lived in the dockside districts of East London. Now, Cockney was treated not as another variety of English, like Scots or Yorkshire, but as bad, inferior and slovenly. By Victorian times, accent and class were becoming synonymous. Speech, education and advancement went together guarantee good English and a good future, parents would send their children away to school. The English public schools took boys from all over the country and gave them a standard English accent. With the right accent, the educated middle class became captains of industry, army and navy officers, imperial civil servants, lawyers, politicians, and even teachers who would pass their accents to the next generation. As this film of Winchester shows, these public school attitudes survived unchallenged into the 1960s. By then, the public school accent had become universally the English of radio commentators and television interviewers. Of course, a lot of people say that, um, uh, a lot of people in the Labour Party think that the public school should be abolished uh, because they produce snobs. Do you think there's any truth in that at all? Um, anyone got any comment on that? To a certain extent, I think, yes. You do? Could you come forward a bit? Um, in what in way? Um, I well, I think it, it helps to make class distinction all the greater if you get two so separate bodies as the grammar yes. school and the public schools. I think somehow you ought to merge them together yes. a bit. What do, you, what do you think the answer will be? To compromise more in the future? Um, yes, I think you want to start slowly and yes. not do it all at once. Yes. Do you think that will happen? Well, I think it may do. Yes. It depends on what happens in the government. Superficially, this is still unchanged. Twenty years later, the right words and the right accent, a world away from Cockney, are still important for a successful career. The new boys are still drilled in Winchester school slang. What are battlings? Uh, they're weekly pocket money. What is mugging? Sorting up. What is a cropple? It's a punishment given by a prefect or don. What is bartering? Cricket practice. Cricket fielding practice. Who is Jupiter? A notorious rascal of St. Cross, Lance's defunct, who has been a notion since time immemorable. Immemorial! Who is Jupiter? Dr. John Wells is an expert in the evolution of British accents. But even in 20 years, there have been some significant changes in public school English. And what is a cropple? A punishment for being ex trumps right? What is pitch up? One's parents or relations. I think there are two main differences in the voice quality between the two excerpts we've seen. In the earlier one, they're rather tense in, around the larynx, and they've also rather strangely got creaky voice coming in of the kind, no, no. In the more recent excerpt, they're more relaxed and they don't have that creaky voice. So in the earlier one, they're saying things like, slowly, quickly. Um, yes, I think you want to start slowly and uh, not do it Whereas the once. newer trend is to make it closer, more like the E of beat, and say quickly, slowly. One thing is the A ah vowel, the vowel that comes in words like trap. We had that word battlings, and in the earlier excerpt he was saying something like battlings. What is a jerry bone battlings? Whereas in the newer one it's more like battlings. What are battlings? Uh, weekly pocket money. The other vowel I noticed is the oo vowel, which we got actually in the word Jupiter that came in both excerpts. Who was Jupiter? This used to be oo, spoon, Jupiter, and we heard that on the earlier excerpt. But on the second one, it's become more like oo, Jupiter. Who is Jupiter? And and this is something that was long regarded as cockney or just vulgar speech, but is now spreading out geographically and socially, spreading geographically from the southeast of England, spreading out socially up the social stratifications towards the upper class. It's become smart to go down market. People are now a bit embarrassed to be seen to be imitating upper class behaviour. And this is reflected, of course, in their pronunciation. 
if you walk down the street, people will say, posh air. <laughs> yes, people tend to think that um, people at public schools have very posh accents. And all very polite and proper. Very lardy da and sort of what ho. What used to be called very good English. Oxford English. You know, sort of tally-ho chaps. Something like that. Um, vastly different to how we sound. These boys are speaking RP, received pronunciation. Good job. That was close. You nearly went back to the beginning. But curiously, they're showing signs of Cockney influence. Like many standard English speakers, they don't say bottle for bottle, but they might say quite interesting for quite interesting. I think you'd say that Cockney is the most important source of new pronunciations coming in. And this is something that isn't just today, but has been the case for 500 years. What typically seems to happen is that some new pronunciation arises in Cockney. It's condemned as vulgar, but then after a time, it comes up market, people start imitating it, and in due course, it becomes received pronunciation. And then a bit later, it becomes old-fashioned and it disappears. And so we have a constant change going on over the centuries. I think there's evidence, for example, that the A vowel in face... Now, we know this started out, well, it was fast, then there was a great vowel shift, it became face. Now, that monophthong, face, which you still get in Scotland and places, gave way to a diphthong A, face. And I think that was originally a Cockney vulgarism. But meanwhile, it's become posh, and it's now the RP form, because Cockney has had another innovation and moved on to face. And that's today's vulgarism. Maybe in another 200 years... The posh form will be face, and the Cockney vulgarism will be something else again. I don't know, voice. Here we go. Two, four, three. And my old man, they fall out of the bag. And a gun, he's a gun. Oh, I went to the bag, but they are back. Hey, yeah, back, sir. Anything you like there, come on, fill the quality. Come on, in your country, cousin, come in. God blimey, I'll tell you what, eh? I've got air. Two hundred years ago, the influence of Cockney began spreading in a more dramatic way. The speech of London and neighbouring counties like Essex and Middlesex was sent into a remote exile when England's petty criminals were shipped as convicts to the penal colony of New South Wales. unseaworthy ships, often dismasted, were moored in the rivers and estuaries and became floating prisons for people sentenced to transportation. They housed the petty criminals of industrial England before the long sea voyage to the prison colonies of Australia. There were many English voices on board, but the predominant one was from the London area. In fact, Cockneys accounted for more than one-third of the original generation of Australians. The first penal settlements in Australia were in Sydney and near Hobart in Tasmania. The convict's new home was strange and exotic. Like the first settlers in America, they borrowed words from the native aborigines to describe things they'd never seen before, like the kulaba tree and the boomerang, billabong, a water hole, and corroboree, a gathering, and place names like Wagga Wagga, Woolamaloo, and Woomera. 
convicts also adopted Aborigine words like kangaroo, wallaby, bandicoot, budgerigar, wombat, koala, and dingo. Convicts and Aborigines meeting for the first time communicated in pidgin English. The Australianism walkabout is an early example of pidgin English down under. Among the convicts, the first visitors to Australia noticed the dominating tones of London English. Australian linguist Professor John Bernard. The uh, greatest number came from London and the counties immediately around London, so that naturally there's a big influence into Australian English from London forms of speech. This is most evident in the pronunciation. Uh, you have the broad A sound, which probably belongs in both dialects, and you do have some words and some uh, word patterns, like rhyming slang. The first Australians invented their own rhyming slang. Ducks and geese for police, and a Captain Cook for a look. Manifestos of the first fleets show that the convicts came from every county of England and Scotland and Ireland, and so many of the words which Australians think are Australian are in fact uh, county words from uh, Great Britain, words like cobber and wowser. Wowser, meaning a killjoy, came from the rural north. Cobber, meaning a friend, came from Suffolk. Larrikin, a youth from Warwickshire. Billy, as in Billy Can, from Scotland. And Barracking, rowdy encouragement, and a corker, a very good thing, from Ireland. The bulk of the uh, early Europeans in Australia were, of course, convicts. And they brought with them the so-called flash language, which was a highly developed jargon which the criminal classes used and which I suppose the people who weren't quite criminal but had been convicted learnt on the ships. And the consequence was that there was an early complaint from the magistrates that they couldn't understand what was being said in their own courts. And Flash Jim Vaux, who managed to get himself transported three times, uh, in 1812 wrote a short vocabulary of the flash language ostensibly to help the magistrates. Yeah. With their ticket of leave, released convicts joined the pioneering free immigrants, drovers, stockmen and graziers, in the bush or the outback. With them went flash talk, words like swag and swagman. There once was a swagman camped by a billabong Under the shade of a coolabar tree And he sang as he watched his old billy boiling Cool, come a waltz and Matilda with me Waltzing Matilda, Matilda, me darling Cool, come a waltzing Matilda with me Waltzing Matilda and leading the water bag Cool, come a waltzing Matilda with me The first squatters established huge sheep farms known as stations. Here, words like jumbuck for a sheep and tucker for food soon gave a distinctive flavour to Australian English. Whose is that jumbuck you've got in your tucker bag? You better come a waltzing Matilda with me. Steady up, steady up, steady! Hello. Behind. Behind. Waltzing Matilda and leading a water bag. Who come a waltzing Matilda with me? Over. Get out. Get over here. Get out. Get out. George Hawker's ancestors were army officers who settled in Bungaree, north of Adelaide. Like the majority of Australian settlers, they came out as free colonists, but they quickly picked up the convicts' Australian vocabulary and accent. There was no convicts here and no convict labour, so all the settlers here were free. They originally camped about four miles to the east of here on what we call the Hutt River. Um, the water there is brackish, so he cast around looking for fresh water and permanent water, which is what he found here. And he actually came and pitched camp here Christmas Day 1841 was there to be taken, and they squatted on it. Well, in the 1880s, they were running 100,000 sheep. Watch out! 
In Australia, unlike England or America, from Perth to Sydney, there is roughly speaking only one kind of accent. In fact, Australian is the most classless form of English in the world. Part Cockney, part Irish, part standard English. It has a proud and egalitarian toughness. What's more, judged by speech alone, workers and bosses, sheep shearers and property owners are all virtually indistinguishable. The reputation of shearers is probably hard working, hard drinking, hard playing types. Well, shearers work for four two hour runs a day, like we work for two hours. Then you stop for a smoker, which is what you'd call a half hour lunch break. It, it pays all right. It all depends how fast you are. If you like um, Neville here, that can wind them out, it pays very well, but you know. Uh, biggest place I do is down the southeast at um, Kukatonga. They shear about 20,000 sheep. There's five of us, and it takes about a month to do them. I find it quite easy. It's, but um, when you see a learner shear, you know, you think, gee, I could never go through that again. Blokes like us others who um, part time shears, it takes us probably about uh, a week or a fortnight to get ourselves physically fit so that we can shear through without sort of feeling a bit buggered at the end of the day. Gives you hell when you first start off. And usually aches right through my run, but, and then you start again the next year, and it's the same thing. Now the shearing's over, and we've all got our check. Roll up your swags, and we're up along the track. The first pub we come to, it's there we'll have a spree. And to everyone that comes along, it's have a drink on me. Click, 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 that's how the shearing goes. Click, clickety, click, go, oh, me boys, it is slow. A fella pulls down a cheek, and it lands in the kick. And still you hear the shears are going click, click, click. Today, some 90% of all Australians speak with unashamed Australian accents. But there's still an echo from colonial days. A minority, like George Hawker's aunt, Joan, still speak what's known as cultivated Australian. This is the closest to the standard middle-class speech of England. My parents used to correct us as children. They would tell us if our vowels were incorrect. And I think I had passed that on to my children. I'm not finding it so easy to pass it on to the grandchildren. They are very much more Australian than I think we would like them to be. They seem to do, pick that up when they go to school. They pick up the, the, the very ugly Australian accent. But as I say, if they're picked at enough, they may change. Well, I suppose it's my generation. I've been taught that, that that's not the way you should talk, that you should try and keep your vowels, um, well, much better, much more English than, than that rather harsh, unpleasant sound it is to, to my ears, and I think to a lot of my generation. Australian English evolved in the outback. But today, 80% of Australians live in the big cities, and the biggest is Sydney. Australian English is actually part of a family of English accents. And at Sydney's 18-foot yacht races, you can hear the crews speaking with all the accents of that family. Australia and New Zealand and South Africa were settled in what is roughly the same period, and from the point of view of the linguist, the same period. And there are great similarities between the three dialects. In South Africa, the white person became a managerial uh, subject very quickly, and so uh, South African English tends to climb towards the uh, more prestigious uh, varieties which are available. Australians and New Zealanders say that this kind of sailing can carry them faster than the wind. Crews from both countries have very similar accents. Even some locals can have difficulty telling them apart. Australia's Rob Brown is world champion 18-foot skipper. There has been known to be betting on these races. Uh, officially, there isn't. But uh, 
Australians have been known to sort of bet on two flies calling up a window. The boats are very demanding boats to sail. It needs coordination between three people and split-second timing. You must be agile. I think they're the hardest boat in the world to sail. The New Zealand crew shares an almost identical pronunciation of a word like sail. We like to think that they are about the fastest boat in the world that can actually sail around a racing course in all conditions. The sails are so large that any little puff of wind they want to tip over. It's a bit like walking a tightrope, really. What separates them uh, is the fact that New Zealand had a greater feeling of identity with the old country than Australia did, where, of course, alienation begins with the convicts. And so you get the same base, but then it points off in different directions. How are you, mate? How are you, mate? John Bernard likes to measure the nuances of the Australian accent scientifically. He plots the rhythms of Australian speech and says that despite its cockney beginnings, much of Australian English is unique. There are many differences between London English and Australian English. In general, Australians sound the H. If you regard the dropping of an H as a cockney feature, then this is a difference between cockney and Australian English. How are you, mate? How are you, mate? The uh, Australian dialect doesn't have the glottal stop. That's the sound in the pronunciation like bottle. The whole range of ordinary vowels in Australian English take a set of values which are different from those in Cockney. This situation has been confirmed by studies of lip movement, some in the course of an X-ray analysis of the uh, vocal mechanism. Can you grimace now? and some by high-speed photography, which shows the front of the face and the side of the face at the same time. Cheem. George. It would not be true Jean. to say that Australians don't Jean. open their lips at all, Door. but it would be true, I think, Boo. on present evidence, to say that they Boo. open them less than some Boo. emphatic British speakers. Sir. Sue. This distinctive Australian accent, like its Cockney ancestor, was despised for generations. Cultivated Australians were often ashamed of their speech. The Australian opera singer Dame Nellie Melba complained about our twisted vowels, our distortions and flatness of speech, which, she said, seriously prejudices other people against us. Until quite recently, many Australians shared that attitude. Today, Australian comedians play off this cultural cringe and make it part of their act. In this generation, there's been a reaction to this cultural cringe. In fact, it's become a minor Australian industry in theatre and entertainment. Far from apologising for Australian speech, they're exploiting it to the hilt. By exaggerating its characteristics, Australian comedians mock both their fellow countrymen, who cringe, and the British, who condescend. The effect has been to make a lot of Australians feel good about their accent. So, humour is having a significant impact on the language, as it always does. The founder and high priest of this cult of self-mockery, who uses the most colourful Australian language as his raw material, is the writer-performer Barry Humphreys. The best living Australianisms have become an essential part of his satirical impersonations. All this would horrify his most celebrated creation, the Melbourne housewife, Dame Edna Everidge. Oh, well, I think, if I may, I think I must say a word for the women. Speak to Australian women. I think we are the custodians of correct Australian speech. I'm sorry, but we are. A lot of our men folk, I think, speak a little too roughly for my liking, particularly people that Barry Humphreys employs in his shows. So Les Patterson is an example, I think, of a very poor type of Australian speaker. And I wouldn't like people overseas, particularly in the old country, as we call England, to judge Australia by that. Hello, you there. Beautiful. What a nice turn <laughs> Another Humphreys character, Sir Les Patterson, is supposed to be an Australian cultural attaché. Sir Les parodies the typical ochre, the broadest Australian speech and behaviour. 
Everyone goes along with the joke. Australia's ABC went live when he launched his latest record and book. Twelve inches of Liz and the Travelers too. Uh, Celeste, I've been taking a close look at your Traveller's Tool, and, <laughs> and in it you've got words like conchy, cobber, chunder, chuck. Now, these words may be indispensable here in Australia, but, but what use would they be to a traveller who's uh, attempting intercourse in foreign parts? I presume you mean social intercourse. That's how I read it, anyway. Why do Australians have sexual intercourse so quickly, you know? The old story is so they can get down to the pub and tell the fellas, you know? <laughs> Australian English abounds in ripe comic similes. Humphreys loves phrases like a kangaroo loose in the top paddock for a crazy person, as scarce as rocking horse manure, as happy as a bastard on Father's Day, a veranda over the toy shop for a paunch, and hanging around like a fart in a phone box. I felt rather like those composers of the early... English composers of the early 20th century. Vaughan Williams crouching behind a hedge recording a ploughboy's whistle. I used to interview taxi drivers. I used to make jottings. I found a lot of these notebooks. And, uh, of course, although I collected a lot, a lot of the rich um, and generally scatological Australian vernacular, I made up a lot of it, too. Yeah, a little lady... Tell us what burning social issues keep you awake at night. Well, generally I get a burning social issue in the morning if I get one. Most of us who go to England try to get rid of our Australian accents if we can, or we did. It's less fashionable to do so now. And some of us actually put on a stronger Australian accent than we really have. Anxiety may be the reason for this because we've always felt, with our accents, rather inferior, you see, to our English cousins. As indeed we are. One champion of the Australian voice with no worries about inferiority is Alan Morris. With his partner, Alan Johnson, he set up Mojo, the first advertising agency to take the radical step of shooting all its commercials in Australian English. Well, there's no such thing as an Australian accent in television advertising particularly until about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, one considered the, the Australian public probably ashamed of our pretty grating nasal sort of accent. And the Australian accent just wasn't used because it wasn't classy enough. And it did great. It was so unusual to hear it. It would grate on, on ourselves to hear it. We just didn't realise how we spoke because you didn't hear it on air very often except in comedy shows or to send something up. <laughs> so we just started speaking on television and commercials in the language that belonged to the people. And there's 15 million people out there that aren't here. They don't seem to be too ashamed about communicating with each other. America, you look like you need a holiday. A fair income holiday. In the land of wonder. The land down under. Now, there's a few things I've got to warn you about. Firstly, you're going to get wet. Because the place is surrounded by water. Oh, and you're going to have to learn to say good day. Because every day's a good day in Australia. G'day, Paul. G'day, love. Of course, you'll have to get used to some of the local customs, like getting a suntan in the restaurant, playing football without a helmet, and calling everyone mate. Thanks, mate. She's right, mate. Apart from that, no worries. You'll have the time of your life in Australia. Because we talk the same language. Although you lot do have a funny accent. Oh, before you rush out to book your Aussie holiday, call this toll free number for your free Aussie holiday book. Come on, come and say good day. I'll slip an extra shrimp on the barbie for you. Come and say good day. Obviously, advertisers like Mojo were responding to something in the wind. This new confidence in Australia's own distinctive brand of English is evident in the thriving film industry. Films like Picnic at Hanging Rock, Gallipoli, My Brilliant Career have not only won worldwide acclaim, they have given Australia's voice a hearing in cities like New York and London. So have the books these films were based on. 
Australians are celebrating this new confidence in their own cultural identity with a booming literature. And central to that confidence is the language used by authors like Patrick White, Frank Morehouse, Thomas Keneally, Peter Carey. Peter Carey's latest novel, uh, Illywhacker, in fact draws its title from the Australian slang word for a con man. One contemporary Australian writer who likes to kick sand in the face of respectability is the humorist Cathy Lett. My hobby is people perving. So my very favourite thing is to go down into the suburbs, to the pubs and hang at the beach and pick up jargon and, you know, I'm, I'm a cannibal in that way, that I cannibalise people's dialogue. Now I'm looking for Sunny Richards, who's a really hot surfer, and she's great because she's got no tickets on herself. Oh, if you've got tickets on yourself, that means that you're, you're up yourself. You, you've, you think too highly of yourself. It means that you've put an expensive price tag on yourself, sort of Gucci. And uh, she's a bit worried about me because she thinks I'm turning into a bit of a trendoid. A trendoid is someone who lives in the inner city, wears red glasses. <laughs> so she's, going to, she's got to brush up my dialogue. The sound of Australian dialogue is changing. One contemporary characteristic is the speech habit known to experts as the rising inflection. When I take you down to the beach and you meet some of the girls, they talk like this. Sunny will say, oh, I went down to the beach and I saw these guys and they were really spunky. I think it's a sign of insecurity because they're always waiting for someone to say you're wrong or rack off or shut up. So that's why they suffer from it. It's not contagious. <laughs> Sunny, good day. Hi. Hi. Very good. <laughs> so, what's the surf like, Sunny? Tell me. Well, there's a good left suck up over there, but it's a bit blown out, so it's not not not, not as best. Now, how long have you been surfing for? About two years. Yeah, and two years. what? How do the guys cope with that? Because I mean, once if you surf down here, they'd get you bored and they'd break it and they'd ding it up and chuck oh, you off. So they drop in heaps, but. So when get they lost. drop in, what do they do? Dropping in means they take off inside of you, so they ruin your wave, they drop in on you, yeah. so there's not much of the wave left. Now just tell me about the real reason you come to the beach. I know it's not really for the surf, I know that really it's for the great Australian pastime of perving. Oh well, I think, <laughs> actually, I think the best perv are the clubbies, definitely. The they've clubbies? Got the clubbies have got the best body. You wait till they get out of the water, and of course they've got their scandies pulled right up, there. Right up the right up the crackaroo. So it's just beautiful buttocks oh, all around. Beautiful buttocks all around. <laughs> and Australians and Americans are like oysters and custard. You couldn't get further extremes, um, especially with their language. I mean, I think Americans suffer from vowel cancer. They have this terrible habit of, of adding, of complicating sentences and making them convoluted. And Australians are the opposite of that. We tend to amputate words. A typical Australian sentence would be to say that you were taking a sicky, shoving a few tinnies in the esky, going down the beach, say, with the truckies. When we think about the English, we tend to think of them as plucking their highbrows and of feeding themselves the sauruses intravenously and conquering the great indoors, we always think of them indoors reading books. So we tend to stereotype the English, the plum in the mouth and you know, never getting down and getting dirty. We've always lived in the shadow of England and been almost embarrassed to be Aussies. Um, and now that, now that we're getting more confident about who we are, there's been a whole resurgence of our, of our slang. Sardonic, profane and irrepressible, the voice of contemporary Australia has shaken off its cultural cringe. And perhaps no one has done more to internationalise this slangy self-confidence than Barry Humphreys. This is a nice poetic bit now coming up. <laughs> Little bit of music leaking in. This is a hint to those blokes at the ABC who have been sitting on their bums all through this. Little bit of nice soft music. You with me? Sometimes I think I might just chuck it all and hang a few Fred Williams on me wall. Sip Chardonnay grown by some merchant banker. And read the National Times like any wanker. <laughs> Some wowsers still call me King of the Ockers. But every successful Aussie has his knocker. <laughs> I guess if I were some poor clapped-out failure, I'd finger blokes for rubbishing Australia. 
pig's ass I would. <laughs> I think I'd sooner cark it than sell out to the phony flag waving market. So out with the wowsers and the demagogues before this land of ours goes to the dogs. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Very much. No worry. I am basically a theatrical caricaturist, and so I'm interested in all these exaggerated and rich and expressive forms of speech. I think that slang, that colloquial English, is very much alive and well still in Australia, and uh, thank God for it. When shearing comes, lay down your drums and step on the board, you brand new chums. With a rod'em, rod'em, rub-a-dub-dub, we'll send them home in a laundry style. There's brand new chums and cocky sons, they fancy that they are great guns. With a rod'em, rod'em, rub-a-dub-dub, we'll send them home in a laundry style. With your huts of bark and your old dirt floors And your daughters never wear any drawers Nor any kind of boots and shoes They're wild in the bush like kangaroos A panic and a flower and a shade of bark To wallop up a damper in the dark With a rod'em, rod'em, rub-a-dub-dub We'll send them home in a line we stop Well, here we are in New South Wales Shearing lambs with daggy tails With a rod'em, rod'em, rub-a-dub-dub We'll send them home in a lime juice tub 